<laughs> Check it out, it's good. Um, yeah, I, well, that's where, where part of the book is set in, mm -hmm. in the house in World War II, things we've got. So I've got, yeah, very fond memories of this part of London, but I don't know Walthamstow as well as I would like to. <laughs> so, so, how does publishing a book, um, how does it compare with releasing an album? Um, it's a lot more relaxing, really. And, and it's, a, it's quite a nice, sort of, it's a nice world, it, it's more pleasant. So uh, far? So far, I, think. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen the dark side of it yet, I don't think. I'm sure there is a dark side of it. Yeah, I mean, but the music industry, it's, you know, it's very kind of, uh, it can be very catty and very, uh, sort of, I don't know, there's a, there's a sort of like a taut tension to it. And um, it, it feels, I don't know if it, because, because, Releasing a book isn't my main thing in life. I, I feel as though I can sort of slightly detach from it in a funny sort of way, which is really nice. It that means that I can sort of enjoy it, hopefully. But I have been enjoying the whole process so far. I think it's really helped that the book's been really well received. That's been really nice. I think it would have been kind of very different if it had been pilloried, because I think writing something really personal and then it being, it, it being kind of like received badly would be quite hard to take, so mm -hmm. it's nice that it's been t taken seriously. I mean, you, you mentioned the book that suffering from anxiety at various times, and was there any anxiety about publishing a book? Very much so, yeah. I, mean, I, I had to very much kind of make sure that I was okay with it. Uh, um, uh, I remember having having this sort of point before I sort of sent it to anyone, and knowing that, that as soon as I sent it to someone, that would almost almost be the point of no return kind of thing. I had to really sit down with myself and really ask myself if I was going to be happy with this, knowing that a lot of the information was very very personal, and, and, and being very sure that I was I was going to be okay with that, you know. But I think the writing a book. The, the reason I was was happy with it in the end was because I did. I mentioned in the book that I that I did it very much on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And I think with the book you can be, you know, you, can, you wake up the next day and you can think, ah, oh, I don't, I'm not sure about that sentence. You know, it's not quite right. And I, I manicured it a lot, you know, and, and thought about it a lot. I didn't just sort of bash it off. And I wanted it to have a, have a kind of a, a sort of life. You know, I mean, you mentioned in the book that you started out writing it as, as something for your son, a record for your son to read when he, when he was older. What point did it change? What point did you start thinking about this is something that you wanted to, to publish? Yeah, um, I'm not really sure. I suppose, yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because people would assume, I think that there's, you know, people would assume it's like disingenuous me saying that I wanted to write it for my son and then, well, why didn't I just sort of like leave him in the loft and for him to find him in his 20s sort of thing? Uh, and, and that's, I don't really know why that is. Uh, I suppose there's a natural kind of, Despite the fact that I feel quite quite sort of protective of my private life, there's a a natural kind of need to share mm. with any author or any artist. You you need an audience to sort of somehow feed off. And there's a, I never kind of quite get this sort of th there's a sort of like a, a cliche with musicians, you know, that, oh we just make music for ourselves. Mm. That mm. that kind of cliche. And I think that's sort of a, a, that's sort of a disingenuousness that almost like borders on sort of deceitfulness kind of thing. I think there's a natural, you need an audience to sort of like, to, to gauge a sense of, of to, to gauge your art in a funny sort of way. Um, so I don't really know at what point I put it, but there was a point that it became more than just a, a letter to my son, it became more just a, a thing about my life. I was thinking that you know your son's going to read this, did that shape what you put in the book and what you left there? No, not really. No, I wanted to be to be quite honest. No, I didn't. I assume that he'll pick it up when he's sort of 25 or something, when these things can make more sense. Yeah. To him. I didn't. I didn't sort of shy away from things because I, you know, I didn't. I didn't have that sort of filter that you have for a child. Yeah. In yeah. a sense, you know, even though it's not salacious in any way, but still, I didn't kind of. No, I, I wasn't thinking that. And um, you're somebody who's been written about a lot right from the very beginning of, of Sway as a band. Um, was there a desire to take your story back and, and correct misapprehensions? I think so. That's a good point. I think, I think to a certain extent, that's true. Um, I think that there's been a lot of, <clears throat> you know, I, it's interesting. Over the last 25, 26 years, however long we've been in the public eye, I, I think the persona is is woven 
around you. And sometimes that persona takes on the life of its own. And there's a huge chasm between the person and the persona, and it's something that, that's really fascinated me over the years, looking at myself as a real person and looking at the persona that's sort of built up around me. And, and, and it's a fascinating duality, the, the chasm between those two things. And I suppose a lot of it with, with writing about, writing Cold Black Morning was, was not in any sort of like score settling way sort of thing, but just sort of saying, well, this is how I see myself. Yes. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a sort of like a, a kind of irritating kind of like you know, sort of like trying to trying to destroy my own self myth or something. It wasn't yeah. kind of like that. It was just like, well, that's how the media has chosen to see me, this is how I see myself. And I'm aware that both of them are fictions, mm -hmm. both of them are truths. You know, there's not there's not an absolute truth there. And you didn't feel the, the need to sort of settle scores like other writers? Have no, absolutely not. I, I, quite the opposite, actually. I, I, was, I was quite careful not to. I, I, I always feel when you read those kind of rock memoirs that just seem to be sort of people slagging other people off, mm. I was, I'm always suspicious that, that it's a cheap shot and that's all they've got and, and there's no substance behind that. And there's not, you know, if that's how they're keeping people's interest. And I thought that. I, quite the opposite. I wanted to write about very unsensational things and try and write it, write about it sensationally. That was my plan. And it feels like the inspirations for this book weren't so much music books necessarily, but uh, but other other autobiographies. Mm. Yeah, that's you know, side with Rosie was my was my kind of starting point. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was reading it a few years ago, and just the language and just the sort of descriptions of an everyday world, and I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an Arcadian vanished world that Laurie describes, but it's still, there's something sort of prosaic, but so beautiful about the way he describes the grannies, and there's a, there's a phrase that I love, the sickle bent bodies, and it's these little turns of phrase, so beautiful, and I try to sort of emulate that, which is, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, sort of, I, don't, I don't mean that it comes anywhere near that, but that, that was, you've got to have, you've got to have ambition, Absolutely, yeah. in order to stretch, yeah, and, yeah. and sometimes miss the target, but at least you try and reach that. Yeah. When you look back at those early days of, of Suede, did the, the memories feel very fresh, or does it feel far away? Um, <coughs> well, writing the book, it, it kind of, it sort of stimulates those memories, I, I found. You, you know, they, they do seem very distant, but I did I did feel there was a sort of a sort of time machine element to writing the memoir, where I was back there in those moments, and suddenly you, you, people often say to me, God, how do you remember these things in such detail? And I, I'm like, I don't really know. Just, as soon as you start writing about it, it, it you, your mind uncovers these little details, and you kind of go in there. You know what it's like as a writer, you think, God, how am I going to get through this chapter? And you just do because these little thoughts spool into each other, yeah, and, you're, yeah. and, you're, and you're, these synapses start firing. Uh, and it's the same with writing a memoir. It just, it just, it kind of like reveals itself. It's there inside you somewhere. Is that something that happens on stage when you're, you're singing a song that you've written a long time ago? Does that, does it come back to you the original time of writing that song, or is it different every time? Some songs, there's, there's certain, certain songs that that, that are, are like that. So something like the Asphalt World. <coughs> it, I'm always, I'm always there within the narrative when I'm singing that song. And there's certain songs that, no, it, they're just songs. Right, you know, you, it, you, you can, not every song you can inhabit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's certain songs that are just some words and a nice tune sort of thing. But there are certain songs that do it. Um, artists don't often like to uh, acknowledge failure, um, but you say up front that that's what this book is about. How did that unlock the writing process for you? I think uh, it was, it gave it a tone. That's the that's the that's the word that I that I that I'd use to, to describe that. I gave it a definite tone, um, and I wanted it to sort of like be uh, circumscribed within those boundaries. I didn't want to sort of just write a book about everything that has happened to me. Yeah. I think you end up with a sort of like list of stuff, and it's like, oh, then I did this, then I did that, then I did the other sort of thing. And I wanted it, you know, when I start, I I, I set up set set the book out saying it's about failure. And, and that's sort of, you know, those are the those are the parameters. It's like kind of like you, sometimes things are too open ended, mm -hmm. and I needed that set of goals yeah, to, yeah. To, to stay within those limits. It's like sometimes when I'm writing a, writing an album, 
we had a, with the new album we were writing, we had a series of rules for it, um, a series of sort of checkpoints that we kept referring to, a world that we decided that, we, that it was going to live in, sort of thing. And, it, and it's like that. Sometimes you, you need that to, to, to know where you're going. If, the, if, the, if, you're, if your agreement is just like, we'll write an album, it's like, that's too open ended. Yeah. You need a, something more specific. Can you share some of those rules that you're using? Well, yeah, the, the new album that we're writing, it, it's set in a very specific place. It's, uh, I, I think probably, I, I've described this before, but it's set in, in a kind of, in, in a, in a kind of rural hinterland, a kind of, a sort of liminal world of, of, of roadkill and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and bee roads and sort of pylons and concrete paths and stuff like this. It's a very, it's a very geographical setting. Very unpleasant world. <laughs> 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 Still try and stay unpleasant. <laughs> so with this, this geographical setting, I mean that was something that you uh, that, that's been part of your education right from the very beginning. Because uh, I, I was quite surprised reading reading the book to to, uh, to find out that you'd uh, studied town and country planning, town and country country. It is the rock and roll. So this this seems a very left field choice for a, for a musician. To yeah. Stand. Well, you, well, I don't want to offend any town and country fans. Exactly. You'll be careful here. Yeah. But how did you how did you arrive at studying? Oh, I don't know. It's one of the weird things. I was studying sciences at A level, and, and that was the only. And I didn't want to suddenly realise I didn't want to be a scientist. I'm like, God, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, for me personally, I kind of like suddenly achieved a state of consciousness when I was about 17. And previously, I'd just sort of like been dragged along in this sort of slipstream. I think lots of kids are like that, you know. I, I didn't. I suddenly almost woke up. What the fuck am I doing? <laughs> studying, studying this, and so I didn't want to study science as a, 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 a degree and sort of become a scientist again. With all due respect to, to people studying, so it just wasn't my thing. I didn't feel as it was in me. I went to a school, a, a, a kind of roughish, comprehensive that didn't teach arts particularly well, to be honest with you, and certainly if you were a bright kid, you weren't, certainly when I asked into arts, you and I was able to do sciences quite well, and so I just did them and ended up sort of studying those things. And so I ended up doing town and country planning because it was the only sort of, it wasn't even artsy, but it was kind of like, it sort of had a, a, a sort of a, a, a sort of breadth that, that, I, that sort of appealed to me. It wasn't, basically wasn't sort of standing around in a, in a, in a, in a laboratory um, fiddling with petri dishes. You yes, know. yeah. Take this off. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you should have a spider. <laughs> 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 Doesn't have a spider. 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 But did it shape your, the way that you thought about music? Because there's a very strong sense of place in, in, in this way to music. Right? I think it did, yeah. I think it, I think it sort of bled through. And you're right. There's a lot. There's a, there's lots of sort of you know the urban landscapes, the landscape and kind of cliches in, in, that sort of drifted into cliché at some point in like 1999. And, and but like, yeah, it's, it's definitely from that. And the sense of place has always been important to me. And when I'm when I'm writing as well. I feel as though that's what I can do, you know. I'm not really with dialogue. Mm -hmm. I've tried to write dialogue and I just can't do it. I kind of like, it doesn't feel natural to me. But I can describe a room and I can describe a sort of situation. And so lots of the stuff in Cold Black Mornings, it, I feel as though it's strength, one of its strengths is, is when I'm kind of describing flats and, you know, spaces. Yes, I mean, those locations really vividly. Come to life yeah. and really get a sense of, and at times, well, you know, how, how things are different, different, the sort of physicality of the, the region yeah. we're in growing up. Yeah. I mean, how did it feel to be in that kind of environment and, and having a kind of, you know, creative uh, mind? I mean, did you feel that you were being encouraged, or did you feel that it was something that was being criticised and attacked? At the university? No, no. I mean, uh, throughout your childhood and teenage years. Um, well, I, you know, my, my parents were sort of very creative people, my, especially my mum, 
but they weren't, <coughs> they didn't sort of really know about education. So they were from a sort of a class and a generation that they, that they, they, were, they were sort of cultured in their own way, but they didn't, they didn't sort of see that as a, as a sort of route to anything. It was just, mm -hmm. the, it was, that was just the sort of people they were. My mum was very artistic, and, but she was never sort of like, what are you gonna do with your life? I never had those kind of discussions with her. Um, I had those kind of discussions with my sister, so was, because she was a few years older than me. But um, so there was never a kind of a, 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 a sort of plan. And mm -hmm. so I sort of, you know, otherwise I possibly wouldn't have become a musician because I wasn't trained as a musician. I didn't study music at school. I hated music at school. It was kind of a pretty boringly taught subject in my school. Um, and God knows how I ended up having the kind of confidence to think that I could do it. But, Somehow I did. I mean, you talk in the, in the book about the conflicts you had with your, your father, who was very mm. into classical music. Do you think that informed the way that you, you wrote music, either by rebelling or, or actually absorbing any of the, the, the lessons that he, that he was teaching? Yeah, I think it did. I think that the, the, the sort of the, the, the charged battleground that was our, that was our you know, our, our, our way that we communicated together, it was, it was, it, we were always arguing about music. Mm. Mm. So it made me very, very opinionated. He was, Incredibly opinionated. It was, it was like it was. It was his. You know, he'd start these very, very kind of like confrontational conversations about sort of you know how how Franz Liszt was obviously much better than the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. That would be the conversation <laughs> that we had, and it was like a sort of Christmas tradition. That we'd sort of sit there. I'd say I'd describe it in the book, but it would, you know, we'd have our Christmas dinner, and then we'd have our paper hats on, and then he'd start with the kind of like. Well, obviously, satisfaction isn't as good as uh, <laughs> isn't as good as the Nimrod symphony. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on then. Would you write Let's it? do it. You know. <laughs> and would you enjoy arguing with him, or was it? Sometimes, yeah. but it'd be quite. He, he, you know, he, it would always get quite personal. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be just a sort of nice intellectual discussion that we kind of like end and sort of like agree to disagree. It would kind of like end in these sort of like <coughs> fraught sort of. Um, Sulks, you know, mm -hmm. so it was it was all a little bit a bit odd. So, but anyway, it kind of gave me this sort of like background for being able to discuss music and having an opinion about it. And there was mu always music in the house, always, always, always. And we didn't really have a television until I don't know when, the mid seventies or something like that. So that was what was yeah, our entertainment. There was just music playing all the time. Um, so there was music playing, and then my mum was painting. So I was kind of like, you know, when I was a, when I was a young boy. We didn't have TV, so I just sit. We just sit and draw. Mm -hmm. That's what I used to do with my mum and my sister. My mum, my dad was out of work, and just sort of sit and draw things. And that, that was kind of quite nice. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I, I sort of try and sometimes try and do that with with my little boy to try and, I don't know. There's something nice about that, you know. This obviously is the parents' 21st century fear of their children. It's falling into this world of screens, and and there's something you know that I really value about about turning the screens off and sitting down with a pen and a piece of paper. I mean, the visual sense was obviously very important to sway them. It's all the way, I mean, I think it's a, a beautifully produced book. I mean, where, where, I, know, I noticed the cover image was something you'd also used for, for a collection of your, your yes. cello albums. Yeah. Where did that image come from and how did you end up using it? Um, it was just a picture that a friend of mine, Paul Kira, took. He's, I've worked with Paul for, for, for many years and just, it's just an image I really liked. It's, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, in a funny sort of way, I think, you know, if I was kind of going to choose a, a cover image again, I, I, maybe I, you know, it would have been nice to have chosen a picture that's more relevant to, to those years, mm -hmm. sort of probably mm -hmm. but somehow the picture sort of sums up how I sort of see myself a little bit, I thought it was um, So, I mean, when the... One of the touch, most touching bits, I think, in the in the book is when you write about your father finally being impressed with your achievements when you played the Royal Albert Hall. Mm. What was the significance of that moment for him? Well, I think it was, you know, it, all of a sudden he could sort of relate what I was doing to what he the music that he loved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his church was the Royal Albert Hall. Mm -hmm. He'd kind of, you know, save up to go and see Ramanov there. And, all, all of these sorts of things, and that was his, that was his thing. So the day that we played the Albert Hall and I put him in a box, it suddenly, you know, it kind of related to his world rather yeah, than sort of standing yeah. at the back of the Brixton Academy. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, he, he kind of got it, which is really nice. Yeah. And was there a similar moment for you where you felt 
we've arrived, you know, that, that, that you've actually had the success that you were. I don't think that thing you arrived. That's the, that's the funny sort of thing. And in a funny sort of way, I think, I think that's a, I never have done. I, 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 and it's probably quite healthy, because it always means that you're sort of striving. Mm -hmm. As soon as you think that you kind of like, it's that sort of like, kind of paradox of, of saying, I know everything. As soon as you say that, then it kind of automatically, it's kind of meaning this statement. So, that, so hopefully, I, hopefully I never feel like that. No. Um, when you went, when, to go back to, uh, I jump forward with Tony Cash, I'm going to say it now, go back to it. I've got it right now. Um, but you went to study in Manchester because of uh, bands that you admired, um, like Joy Division and The Fall, yeah. and the way they, they've written about the city. Um, and I noticed that uh, you, you toured with The Fall with, uh, with Sway. Yes, very, yeah, a couple of, a few, a few days, very, very early on, yeah. How was that experience? Well, it was amazing, because, I mean, I, I, we were such huge fans of the fall. Um, uh, they were an enormous influence for me. Uh, strangely enough, you can't really hear it in Swayze music, but I think lots of the kind of there's a, there's a real primal thing to the, to the fall. Things like the New Big Prince and, and Mr. Pharmacist, and then, you know, and that's what we were kind of trying to do with lots of the, and and we sort of did it in a more glammy way. Things like having the Flash for it, which we heard earlier. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a sort of fully kind of thing, it's very sort of final thing. Um, and yeah, very sad that, that um, Mark died recently, yeah. but you know, my, I didn't have a, you know, we were very young, but I remember him being very, very kind actually. He had a, he had a very, uh, a sort of almost like, there was a sort of, uh, he, he had a persona of, of being slightly bilious and belligerent, mm -hmm. didn't he? Yeah. And I remember him quite the opposite. I remember him coming to, into our dressing room before anyone knew who we were or anything, and him saying, you know, Lars, if there's anything you need, just come to me and ask me. You know, <laughs> really kind of yeah, quite yeah, an yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that was nice. Um, so it, uh, although most of the book deals with your, your childhood and growing up, you know, you do also write about the early days of, of Suede. And, uh, with most bands, they have a, a, an archive list, like right? with the Rolling Stones, it's Bill White, and yeah. with New Order, it's, it's Peter Hook. Was there somebody like that in, in Sway? Is there somebody like that in Sway? And uh, did you uh, go to them with the, to, to sort of check any of the details of the, of the early days? Uh, well, certainly not me, but I think Simon Gilbert, the drummer, is, is, is the closest you get to an archive list. And he, he, he quite early on got kind of like a, a camera and would film us annoyingly. <laughs> There's a thousand little clips of Matt sticking his fingers up <laughs> <laughs> and me going like this. But, um, so one day maybe someone will see them. Um, he used to keep diaries, but kind of. So I kind of asked him just to send me, just just to refer to dates, really. But I think in a funny sort of way, I didn't want to be tied too much to the truth. <laughs> if that, if that doesn't, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. That wasn't the point of the book. Bizarrely enough, I didn't want it to be this kind of, you know, exhaustive sort of like day-to-day -day thing of exactly what we did. Yeah, yeah. I wanted it to have a, I don't know, sort of more impressionistic sort of perspective than being that. I, I leave that up to, you know, a, a biographer. That's almost sure. like a biographer's yeah. job, yeah. rather than an autobiographer's yeah. job, I think. Yeah. And that was quite an important thing. There's a, this, a, a, a phrase I, I use in, in, in the book saying the point of this book isn't that I get the, these kind of things right. Mm -hmm. you know, it's more of a, my perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's probably hard to write it, you know, as well as you do if you're trying to, to, to get all those details in to make it a book of that. Absolutely, um, yeah. I, I, I kind of, I, I was, uh, there's a chapter, chapter eight, which is probably my least favorite chapter stylistically. And that's the chapter where it's almost like a functional chapter where I'm just, we're going from this period of, of kind of um, sort of like you know I met Bernard in chapter seven I think or two, yeah chapter seven and then chapter eight is almost like just sway kind of evolving it was a necessary chapter mm -hmm. and when I was kind of reading it back I was sort of thinking mm, is this just one of those and then we did this and then we did that chapters mm -hmm. and then but it, it was a necessary sort of device to be able to tell the story but I was very aware of that to not just be a list of of things, and then people ask me about, you know, what, you know, are you going to do a second book? Are you going to do, you know, the second book? And I, I'm kind of like, well, you know, if I can do it in a way that isn't just a list of things, then I'll do it. Which is hard because as soon as you 
become successful. You kind of find yourself being dragged along and just, you know, mm. you're not mm. confronted with close-ups of life. You're just sort of, you know, jumping through these hoops. I mean, is there another period that you particularly would look forward to, to, to writing about? Um, well, like I said, it's, it's, it, 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 I think it's much harder as soon as you, you, you become successful. I think, you know, the early days when, when we went through that, <clears throat> we went through that change from being four uh, kids on the dole and working in dead end offices and stuff like that to being, you know, six months later being on the front cover of magazines. That's an incredible, yeah. that was an incredible journey, which would be interesting to, to, to have some from the inside yeah. perspective, yeah. I think. You know, so. um, one of the things that, that, one of the things that struck me about the book that was unusual that, that you know, people writing about music generally don't know is that how friends and events in your personal life are more important to inspiration than some other bands or moments. You know, so when you're saying that when people review records, they often say, oh, it's like this record will be inspired by this, mm. or, you know, and, and as, a, as a critic, that's really all, all you can do unless yes. you've got a kind of, you know, a, a knowledge of somebody's of autobiography. Did you feel in addressing that that you were giving away secrets or <coughs> something you wanted to do? I mean, did you, did, what did you feel about that kind of level of revelation? Um, I felt comfortable with it, otherwise I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have disclosed that stuff. But yeah, that, that was kind of quite an important point to me. I think I made that point when I'm talking about my flat in Morehouse Road, how influential it was on that first album, you know, the kind of, <clears throat> the, the, the combination of, of, of sort of, this sort of like faded decadence. It was a sort of beautiful, you know, it used to be obviously it was a Victorian house with high scenes, but it was kind of falling apart. And, and, the, and the bathroom was this tiny little mildew room and stuff like this, and, and it just sort of was this was this sort of backdrop that those those early songs were, were set in. And I, and I was just trying to make a point that you know, from the music from music writers' perspective, all they can talk about is glam rock or something like that, yeah, and that's totally. their reference points. And it's fine because that's the only reference points. But there's other reference points there yeah, which, yeah. which lie behind these things. I think I was trying to make that point that the personal things are, are just so influential. And as a listener, are you somebody that wants to know all the stories behind your favourite songs? And Absolutely, regret? yeah. I, I, you know, one of my favourite rock, I'm not, I don't read that many rock books, but there's a, 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 a Paul McCartney book called Many Years From Now, <clears throat> which I, I like because it's him talking about the specific sort of starting points of all those songs that we all know so well. And as a, as a songwriter, I find it absolutely fascinating. And that was something that I wanted to do with Cold Light Mornings, you know, kind of like, identify these little um, sort of vignettes in my life that had, that had been a starting point for songs yeah, yeah. Um, and, and say well this is where this song came from and, but again I make the point that even my interpretation of the song isn't absolute sure, I, love, sure. I love that thing where people have got will project their own interpretation of it, which I think is just as kind of valid as my own mm -hmm. I like that kind of brief life in the song um, it's International Women's Day today, and from the very beginning... I like international women. I <laughs> 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 said you were anti <laughs> <laughs> From the very beginning, it's way more unusual in that you, you, you said you wanted to depict women's experiences, uh, young yeah. mothers and lonely wives. Why was that so important to you? Um, um, I can't really tell you a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know, I've just always loved women. <laughs> <laughs> I have, it sounds sort of like, I can't really, I, I, I kind of, I have lot of, lots of female friends. Um, I'm one of these people that, you know, when you kind of go to dinner parties, which I do these days, I'm a bit of sorry. <laughs> you know, being a 50 year old man, I'm not kind of like, you know, sort of like lying in the gutter with, <clears throat> with, with, you know, kind of, you know, reading Jack Kerouac or anything like that, or actually drinking absinthe or anything. Sorry, I never go to dinner parties. It's terribly boring. But I, you know, the kind of thing where my wife will sit and talk to her friend, and I'll get stuck with the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be down that end of the table with guys talking about 
kind of cars or something. <laughs> 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 might have been like listening to what the girls are talking about. Like, I really wish I could be involved in that conversation. They're talking about something, about something about something really interesting. They're talking about how they feel about stuff, which is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how I feel about things. I don't want to talk about tires. <laughs> Tire pressure or something like that. You know? So I've always loved women, and I don't know if women. So there's always been a, a kind of empathy with women, and I don't know. And I, I love. I, I sort of discovered writing from shift perspectives quite early on, and, and that I found that incredibly inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly realising that you don't have to write in the first person, and, and, and you know. That it's almost a tradition in, 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 in songwriting that, that you do have to write in the first person. Mm -hmm. always, and I think that when I st start to not do that, you know, there's a, the music industry is, is very conservative, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, strangely enough, it kind of, it, it pretends it isn't, but especially the, the alternative music industry, bizarrely mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. you know, which is, a, it's, it should be a haven for, for new ideas and experimentation, but I, I've, I've tended to find that it's not, that it, that it values conservatism, it, you know, the alternative music industry tends to like, um, you know, sort of the same model for, mm -hmm. for, for bands over and over, 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 over the years. Uh, and as soon as I write, started writing from a shift perspective, there was a, I think there was a suspicion. People were sort of slightly suspicious of me as a writer, like I was sort of faking it somehow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just found it an interesting device. And, and you know, writing from women's point of view, writing from gay men's point of view, writing from anyone, I suppose, that wasn't me, I thought mm -hmm. was interesting. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, the other thing you do that's quite unusual is, is to sing from a collective, you know, to have groups yeah. of people. Was that something that was deliberate, a conscious decision? Uh, it, I, I thought about this recently, and that, that, I think that's part of, you know, we are the pigs, um, uh, uh, you know, we're the wild ones, these sorts of things. It's, it's, a, it's a search for my tribe. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's, a, it's looking for um, a community, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I never felt I had as a young man, growing up in a sort of slightly strange, dislocated world, mm -hmm. where I didn't feel part of the world I was, I always felt like a bit of an outsider, cliche, cliche, but um, it's kind of true, and I think those songs were looking for that community, mm -hmm. um, trying to find my tribe. So how did they feel when you found your tribe? Well, I'm mm -hmm. to, I don't know, are they here? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> How are you? We're, we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine the, the, the tribes are, you know, more kind of savage and uh, <laughs> very polite tribes. <laughs> How do you feel about other bands that have uh, been inspired by you, like Destroyer uh, recently wrote an album called Ken, mm. after the name of uh, one of your own takes. How did you, how did you feel about that? Uh, it's, it's lovely to be part of that sort of chain of, of, um, of, of, of kind of inheritance, you know. It's, it's, it's nice to know I've always, I was a, fan, a huge fan of bands in the past, and it's nice to pass that band on. Um, <laughs> It's a slightly funny story just because the word, the choice of Kent was named after the, the working title of the Wild Ones, and um, I don't know if the, if, if the guy thought thought that it was uh, had a sort of deep meaning, but it was actually just the name of the other chap that answered the advert that Bernard answered. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, yeah, it's slightly strange. After we talked about that last time, I looked at some of the other working titles you had, and I wondered if you could tell me a bit about the story behind it. What's the story behind Elaine Page? <laughs> yeah, that, well, that was just a, it, it was just a, a song that a, a, a kind of um, a piano-based song that we thought sort of sounded like an Elaine Page pastiche. You know? The funniest one was a song called "Unusual Sex," which didn't really get used. But Bernard, Bernard, you know, he used to sort of like, you know, uh, oh. So this, this dialogue about, oh, do you like unusual sex? You know, I'm like, yeah, that's quite good actually. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a kind of funny little little dialogue between between us, and that's how that whole thing of gay animal sex started. I remember, I remember sort of joking that he gave me a demo of something. I can't remember what it was. And I said, what's it about? And he turned around to me and said, it's about, it's about gay animal sex. <laughs> and that became a bit of a cliche as well. What about Wedgie? What was the song? Well, Wedgie, was, Wedgie was. Richard went through this phase of writing um, a series of 
of, 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 of demo uh, titles that, were, that the theme was childhood tortures. <laughs> and then wedgie, Chinese burn, and dead leg. And dead leg actually became beautiful ones. So that was one of, one of Richard's. Richard. He goes through these themes. I think another one of his themes was was kind of names for penises as well. All right, last one. This yeah, ball. That's, this ball. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just sort of like as, as, as prosaic as you can, as, as, as profane as you can get. So uh, that became trash, actually, this part. So. <laughs> <laughs> it works out around there. Okay. And uh, today, well, yesterday, we found out about the uh, the closing of the, uh, the enemy. We did. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think it's very sad. Um, I think it's really sad. I think the, the enemy really had a had a role, um, uh, and I think it's very sad that we don't have that kind of you know the, growing up <coughs> as a band. I mean, growing up in the 90s with the enemy and the Melody Maker and that kind of tussle, that sort of Punch and Judy mm -hmm. kind of element. Was way more the Melody Maker though. Well, that was the thing. There was a, a huge sort of pull for us in the early days. There was a very famous review that Steve Sutherland wrote <clears throat> when we supported Kingmaker. And it was called Pearls and Swine, but the, but the, 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 the very contentious phrase was it was, was dog shit and diamond, where he was likening us, he was kind of like allying us to the Melody Maker and allying Kingmaker. It was a very, 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 very inflammatory review. And it actually caused the resignation of lots of people years later when he became the Melody